Hi everyone, happy Monday. I hope the week has started out well for you. So we're gonna go a bit further back in time actually than I anticipated for this video. Um, we're gonna um, start out with the late Upper Paleolithic in Southwest Asia. Um, and the uh, late Upper Paleolithic in Southwest Asia is most often referred to as the Epipaleolithic or Final Stone Age. And we will uh, use that term here, um, the Epipaleolithic. And this lasted from around 20,000 to 10,000 BP. And the Epipaleolithic is divided into three different categories. So we have the early, middle and late Epipaleolithic. And the um, Epipaleolithic, it's best attested in the Levant, so Israel, Palestine, Syria and Jordan. And to some extent also in the Sacros Mountains. So. Um, the early Epipaleolithic, um, it's from around 20,000 to 12,000 BP, um, and it's um, best known from the Kibaran, um period or culture, and it's defined by the appearance of microliths, and there will be a, um, a PDF with uh, pictures of microliths um, that will show you the toolkits of the period. Um, so the stone tools they're using. So the early Epipaleolithic, it coincides with the um, uh, Brueling Elobel uh, climate change, which is an uh, abrupt and warm and moist period. And it occurred uh, during the final stages of the last glacial period and lasted from around 14,690 to 12,890 BP. So this uh, climate change began with a cold period, which is called the Oldest Dryas and ended with uh, the abrupt onset of the Younger Dryas, a period that lasted a decade, but within this decade, temperatures went back to near glacial levels. So it went from like, you know, uh, must have been crazy. So during the uh, early Epipaleolithic, atmospheric circulation belts were at the lower latitudes than today. And winter storms path, they crossed Southwest Asia from the Nile Delta to the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, and today it crosses northern Turkey and northern Iran. And beyond the Sinai, uh, the climate of the entire region was extremely cold and dry. Um, the landscape mostly consisted of steppe or desert steppe. Um, woodland was mainly constricted to the uplands of the Mediterranean, Caspian Sea, littorals, and as isolated stands in the Sacros. Um, and the Mediterranean coast was very different from today um, due to the lower sea levels, which meant that it extended by around 10, 15 kilometers. And most of the Jordan Valley, uh, about 200 meters below present sea level, uh, was covered by the Lisan Lake. So the early Epipaleolithic, as I said, was associated with the Kebaran culture in the west, so in the Levant, and the Sarsian um, culture in the east, in Iran. Um, and we will explore them separately, um, since there is a difference between the two. The Kibarian culture is much better understood than the Caesarian, which means the Kibarian culture uh, will be a bit more in-depth, of course. Um, so the Kibarian is defined, uh, was a period defined by um, archaeologist Dorothy Garrett after her excavations at the uh, Kibera uh, cave um, uh, in Mount Carmel in modern-day Israel. Um, back in 1931. Kebaran sites are found throughout the Levant, but are most common in higher rainfall regions. So the sites, they differ in size. Uh, size. Some are very small, 25 um, square meters or less, and some are really large, like 500 to 1500 square uh, uh, meters. Most are around 1 to 200. And the estimates of population size have been made, but about 15 people for the majority of the sites, but at larger sites, this could be doubled or tripled. So the small sites, they are most often located in the steppe, uh, steppes, and here we have a lithic as uh, assemblage, uh, which is dominated by rectangular microliths. Um, and the larger sites are most often located in the Jordan Valley, on the coast and in the upland, and the lithic assemblage is more varied, including uh, other microliths, uh, forms, blades and bladelets. And at the larger sites, there tends to be more grinding equipment, and Kibarian sites have produced early mortars, stone balls and cup holes, boulders with pegged depressions and pestles. 
And it has been theorized that the larger and heavier tools and items will cache at the site to be used for returning groups. So, you know, if you make something that's too heavy, you don't want to carry it around. So you can maybe leave it and then use it when you return at another time. So the most upland uh, of the upland and steppe Kibarian sites were probably campsites of small and highly mobile bands of foragers. And um, there's still some mystery to the exact balance between hunting and gathering. So for the faunal sample, um, it's actually very rare, um, but it indicates hunting system favoring particular species at particular sites. So at Engev 1 in Israel, you have Gesell, Kibera also in Israel, and Nahal Oren in Israel. Um, this is the same at Wadi Madakma, Madamag uh, in Jordan, um, it's goat. And at uh, Sa'akil in Lebanon, uh, it's fallow deer. Um, only a few sites have yielded plant remains uh, in very small quantities. So the sample of um, the plant remains include wild cereals, legu legumes, fruits, um, the Mediterranean zone and steppe species to the east. Um, the best information we have from the Kibarian culture, it comes from the site uh, named Ohalo 2. And the site, it is actually today submerged in the Sea of Galilee in the Jordan Valley. And it was found in 1989 when the la lake levels dropped by several meters. Um, the site has been dated to 19,000 BP and is the category of a large site, so around 1,500 um, square meters. A third of the settlement, uh, it got excavated and it revealed three kidney-shaped structures. And on the edge of these structures, a dark line formed in the soil, composing of charcoal, straw and vegetable stems. Um, this is thought to have been um, marking um, walls of uh, simple huts. And renewal of an earthen floor, um, actually they renewed it three times, in one of the huts suggested a reuse of the huts. And it's fair to assume, assume that people camped here several times over, so they returned to this site several times. Um, huts were found uh, around the structures in, in alignment of burnt stones covered with ash. It's believed to have been a simple oven. Um, and if this holds true, it would be the earliest uh, evidence known for food roasting strategies. Um, and there was a burial of a man uh, found here, uh, and he had survived uh, to adulthood despite physical disabilities, osteomyelitis or infection of the bone in the chest, which would have caused a lot of pain, and he had atrophied upper arm or actually loss of uh, lack of muscles in the upper arm. And he was buried on his back with his legs flexed beneath him with the hands across his chest and he was buried with an incised worked bone tool placed under his head. So the fact that he reached adulthood despite these physical um, disabilities, it points to the group's empathy. They, carry, uh, they cared for him and they didn't leave him behind and they gave him a burial. Um, at Ohalo uh, too, there is a large faunal sample. Um, it consists of fish bones, just gazelle, deer, tortoise, hare, waterfowl and other birds. And you have thousands of carbonized birds, uh, yeah, carbonized this bird, plant remains, and they were recovered, which is not common from Kibarian sites. And the assemblage consisted of mainly grains and other ear fragments of barley. Um, so, um, uh, the ear of the barley is the grain-bearing tip part of the stem of a cereal plant, such as barley or wheat. Um, and um, it could be also concluded that the barley was morphologically wild still, um, so it wasn't domesticated. We also had emma, uh, emma weed, olive, pistachio, grapes, almond and acorns uh, in the assemblage, and all of them were also in wild form. On the grinding stones, starch grains of grass, seeds, probably barley and wheat, have been recovered. Um, it seems that, um, that the Ohalo 2 community was semi-sedentary. Um, they would spend most of the year fishing, gathering and hunting in the Jordan Valley and then move away to higher grounds for a shorter amount of uh, time to gather and hunt. So we move now to the Caesarean. 
um, it's a con contemporary with um, the Kibaron, um, but it's not as well understood as the Kibaron. And this is due to much of the area that has been close to the archaeological field uh, team since the 1960s. So that's a long time. Um, this culture is named after the Sasi cave in Iraq. And almost all the data available today is from cave excavations in the late 50s and 60s. Uh, you have Shanidar Cave, um, which is uh, especially known for uh, the flower burial of a Neanderthal. Then you have uh, Pasangar and you have Yafte. And the Caesarean toolkit uh, consists of blades, bladelets, um, small scrapers and geometric microliths. A lot like the Kabarin actually. So um, small coarse uh, grinding stones have been found, but they are thought to have been uh, used for grinding pigments. Um, the main ungulates hunted was sheep and goats, and goats were especially normal in higher rockier places, and sheep were more normal in lower gentler topographies. And the distribution would have overlapped, as the bands would probably um, move to higher grounds during the summer and lower ground during the winter. And at Shanida, um, there are evidence of goat hunting since the Middle Paleolithic, and onagers were hunted at lower elevations. So other species in the fauna sample includes fallow deer, red deer, roe deer, pig and beaver, uh, waterfowl, river clams, and fish. And plant gathering seems to have taken place on a much smaller scale than in the Levant. The Sarsians seems to have been highly depending on hunting, and their territorial behavior was characterized by um, marked seasonal mobility. And uh, that was actually it for the late Upper Paleolithic in Southwest Asia. I hope you enjoyed it, and it wasn't too difficult, or uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, I look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, bye!